please welcome to the TEDx Sonoma County stage, Rose McDermott. Hi, it's an honor to be here, and um, I'm going to talk to you. If you thought you were going to get away from the election for uh, a few hours, you're wrong again. Um, <laughs> I'm following in many ways on the conversations we've had um, by Rick and Lee Ross, and that's not surprising because Lee was one of my most important and treasured teachers at, when I was a student at Stanford. So what I want to talk to you about today is the extent to which your political ideology is genetically informed and heritable. And so in many ways, in determining your own political ideology and that of your children, the most important choice you make may be your choice of mate. So. For about 50 or 60 years, um, political scientists have assumed that ideology um, results from processes of socialization. In other words, it comes from your school and also for um, your family. So the idea was that you'd have some attachment to your parents and it would be an emotional attachment. So you'd sit at your father's knee, your father would be a Republican, he loved the Republican Party, you loved your father, and so therefore you came to love the Republican Party. That story is not wrong, it's just half the story. And I'm gonna to talk to you today about the other half of the story. So in a seminal study that was done uh, by Lyndon Eaves and um, Nick Martin, what they did was they actually looked at the extent to which social, complex social and political attitudes were genetically informed. What you see here is um, how the ideology was assessed. In other words, they give you name, you know, words or concepts like the death penalty and you say yes, no, or I don't know. And then it assesses your political ideology. And what they found is that um, when you decompose these things, and how you do it is with twin studies, so how twin studies work is you leverage the mathematical difference between identical twins, who are essentially the same person born in two different bodies, and fraternal twins, who are any other sibling set who happen to be born at the same time, and you can decompose how much of some complex behavior or even illness or disease comes from genetic sources, shared family environment like your family or your school, and unique environment, which actually can also include biological things like the in utero um, gestation bath in which you grow as a fetus. And what they found is that in social, complex social and behavior um, and political ideology, about 4%. 0.4% of the variance, about 40% of the variance comes from genetic factors. Now that doesn't mean that 40% of, of your political ideology is from genetics, it means that 40% four, four, you know, of the difference between me and Lee and Rick and anyone else um, comes from genetic differences. Now this can vary by a particular topic or particular issue from things like political party identification, which are actually not very genetic, that's Republican or Democrat, to political ideology, which is highly, almost 0.6% um, genetically informed. The difference in that is that political ideology here, we're talking about the world spectrum of right to left, um, from, say, fascism to communism, as opposed to the difference between Republicans and Democrats, which in the world scheme is actually not very um, different because they share certain values like democracy and capitalism and things like that. So uh, obviously we're confronted right now with a particular choice, but this is something that's not just going on in the United States, it's going on around the world. We saw this recently in the United Kingdom. You can see on the left, uh, Theresa May, who's the um, uh, Prime Minister, and, and uh, Boris Johnson, who was head of the Brexit, uh, on the right. This is obviously going on in France as well. Francis Hollande on the left um, as a socialist, and Marie Le Pen, who's head of the ultra-right party, um, on the right. And then, obviously, we see the differences in the, in the current approach in the United States. So, are these differences trivial? Do they matter? Do they come from any kind of uh, underlying source? And what I want to uh, show you and demonstrate to you today is that there's actually some pretty profound differences uh, in the way that liberals and conservatives actually view and experience the world in some uh, profound ways. So the first is a study that was done, um, this was actually a study done by Darren Schreiber, uh, looking at how brain activation patterns are different uh, according to liberal you know, Republicans and Democrats in this case. You can see pic you know, brain pictures that aren't very well resolved, it doesn't really matter uh, that you can't see them as clearly. But the idea here was that if you looked at how these brain activation patterns happen when they played a risk-taking task, you could predict how people would vote better than asking them their political party identification, which is amazing because that's the gold standard. And what you see here is that Republicans have much more activation in the right amygdala. That's the part of the brain that's been associated with emotion in general and with fear in particular. 
um, what you see with Democrats is activation in the left posterior insula. And that's all about holding mutually inconsistent ideas um, that are mutually inconsistent together at the same time, um, and, and a little bit of disgust. <laughs> True story. You can also see real differences between liberals and conservatives in their reactivity. These are using skin conductance studies. This was a study done by uh, John Hibbing's lab. Um, and what you see here with the um, blue is that people who are um, highly show high levels of support for protective policies, things like immigration, some of the things that we've been thinking about in the current election and, and who tend to be associated with conservative ideas, are much more reactive when faced with threatening stimuli than, than when faced with neutral stimuli. So what does that mean? Well, it means that when we have discussions and we think that we're disagreeing about the interpretation of the same stimuli, in fact, what we're disagreeing about is the actual stimuli itself. We see and hear different things based on our political ideology, and I want to show you an example of that. So when people look at this, different people, and everybody can look at that same picture, but different people see different things. So what you see here on the dots are aggregations of how people see things. So the blue dots are, in general, what liberals are looking at, and the red dots are what conservatives are looking at. Same picture, right? This is using eye tracking technology. What do liberals? Liberals love to look at eyes. They always look at others. They want to know what you're thinking. They want to know how you're feeling. Oops, sorry. Um, and so it's all about the eyes, right? Conservatives are looking at the spider. It's about the threat, right? So it's very different orientation to the same image. And this has political consequences. So again, using eye tracking technology, where here the darker um, shades of yellow into red show what people are paying more attention to, you can actually see that conservatives and liberals are looking at different parts of the image. Conservatives are looking at the badge, right? Symbols of authority. Whereas the liberals are again looking for the face, the eyes. How is this person feeling? And you can tie this not just to what people see, but what they hear. So in these series of experiments, we actually manipulated the verbal story that went along with it and then looked at what people looked at in the picture. So in this particular case, you'll see we told a story um, in the image of the, the soldiers um, saluting. We told them one story where this was, that they're over a coffin, you can't see that part of the picture. We told them a story that what's really going on here is that this person died in combat and the other half of the people heard that the person died as a result of looting. And you can see that that doesn't really um, you know, make a difference in what people pay attention to if you tell the combat story, but if you tell the story about looting, conservatives are paying more attention, spending more time looking at the salutes. And similarly in the other image, telling a story about whether the person is experiencing a beatdown or an arrest doesn't really affect the conservatives very much, but does affect what the liberals are paying attention to. So they're spending a lot more time paying attention to the cane um, if they think that it's a beatdown. You can relate this to how people experience public policy choices. So in this case, people spending more time looking at the flag are um, having a different response to whether or not they think it was a mistake that the U.S. sent troops into Iraq. So if they're spending more time uh, looking at the flag, they think that that's a, a bad idea. On the other side, you see that people who are spending a lot of time fixating on the tanks are people who think that the U.S. Uh, can win the war versus people who are spending a lot of time looking at, say, the sheep. So what does this all mean about genetics? I started out saying this is about genetics, and I wanted to show you the, the biological and physiological ways uh, in which uh, there are differences between conservatives and liberals, um, but some part of this has a genetic instantiation, although different than um, some of the ways that um, we were um, the earlier speaker was talking about social status. So one of the things that drives me crazy, um, just like the other person said it was literally, what drives me crazy is when you see things in the news that say researchers found the liberal gene. Why does that drive me crazy? Because there's no such thing. And there never will be any such thing. Because there's no such thing as a single gene. These are very, very complex processes that work across many different genetic pathways, always in interaction with the environment. We're the only species who can overcome our own evolutionary history by thinking through particular processes, and so just because we have a particular genetic predisposition does not mean we can't overcome it, not only through processes of education, but through our own experience and imagination. 
But one of the really important choices that we make in that regard has to do with who we marry, because it really affects, and had children with, um, because it really affects not only our ideology, but the content of the ideology of our children for um, the heritability reasons that I demonstrated earlier. So this is a this is a iconic study that shows what people think they want when they find a mate. Um, it, it can be updated a bit, and really the only changes this was done by uh, David Buss. But the only real changes nowadays is that men want women who make more money than they used to. Um, <laughs> true story. Um, but basically, people think that what they want is somebody who's nice and somebody who's kind and somebody who's smart and somebody who has good social skills and somebody who has a good social network. Right? All the same. Um, it turns out you're wrong in what you think you want. So we actually did a study where we uh, coded 5,000 profiles on an online dating site. I personally read through 5,000 of them. It was the single most depressing thing I've ever done in my life. <laughs> Every picture of the women were like, "I'm done playing games. I just want a man to pay my, pay for my life." And every single man was like, "I want a smoking hot chick to bring me beer naked while I sit on the couch and watch the game." Right. <laughs> And by the end, you're like, this person in Massachusetts really belongs with this person in Arizona. Is it ethical for me to hook them up? <laughs> um, I didn't do it. Um, <laughs> but what you find is everybody likes to go to the movies and eat out and everything, but they don't really say that they want a particular kind of po um, political orientation in their partners. So you're more likely to say you're fat than to say that you're a Republican or a Democrat. Now, you can assume that that's the Woody Allen thing, it just doubles your chance for a date on a Friday night, um, but that's not what's going on. Part of what's going on here is people don't understand what's really important to them. So are we really selecting each other on politics? And the answer is yes. If you look at what long-term married groups, married pairs, have most in common, there's only three things they have more in common than would be expected by totally random chance. Religion, politics, and drinking frequency. <laughs> Everything else, it's random. <laughs> you think you're marrying somebody that you're attracted to? Maybe not. <laughs> There's one exception, it has to do with race. This is really driven by conservative white men who really, on average, do not want to marry and mate outside their racial group. What does this mean? It means that over time, you get increasing polarization of the population as liberals marry liberals and conservatives marry conservatives because you have this heritability element. So how is it the case that people don't know that they want to match on politics, but long-term stable marriages are people that do match on politics? What that means is that it's not a process of selection. People don't know that's what they want, but it's a process of deselection. They know somebody doesn't quite feel right. Or in particular, they know somebody doesn't quite smell right. <laughs> so we did a study. We suspected that this really had to do with with smell, based partly on some work out of the genetic uh, material that we had, and based partly on prior work that really looked at the influence of immune system function on um, uh, attraction. So we took political partisans, both liberal and conservative. This was done in the Boston area. Had them wear um, gauze pads under their arms for, you know, 24 hours, and they couldn't eat certain foods or sleep with animals or other people or you know wear perfume and all these kinds of things. And then we had uh, 200 other people smell them, smell the, the gauze pads, and. Um, I knew the study was going to work. Where the first day, um, the person I was doing the study with opened a vial and said. Oh, I think I'm going to throw up, and I smelled it, and I didn't smell a thing. And I thought, oh, this study's going to work. Um, <laughs> and what ended up happening was, uh, we asked people, you know, how smart this person was, how trustworthy, and we asked them how attractive they found this person, and we also asked them if they could guess their political ideology. And interestingly, no one got political ideology right, but you could completely predict it based on who they found attractive. So conservatives found conservatives attractive, liberals found liberals attractive. And the very last day of the study, um, I, you know, that there was a young man who came in and he said, "One of your vials has gone rancid. Like it almost made me throw up. I totally couldn't deal with it at all." So that's very interesting. I wrote down the vial number. And right after that, a young woman came in and she said, "What are you going to do with the vials when you're done?" <laughs> And I said, I'm going to do a molecular decomposition. What else would I do? She's like, Are you sure? And I said, Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Why? She's like, Well, you have two. You have a right and you have a left. Can't I have one? 
And I said, no, you can't have one. Why do you want one? She's like, I want to take it home. <laughs> and it was the exact same vial number of the guy who just told me it was rancid. <laughs> but the sample was a conservative guy. The guy who found it rancid was a liberal guy, and the woman who found it attractive uh, was a co-partisan to the man. So this is what our uh, outcome looks like. You have to read this backwards. Men, men really like the smell of women. I should say this is a straight sample because we were looking at genetic transmission. Men really like the smell of women. Women really don't like the smell of other women. Men actually like the smell of other men more than women like the smell of men. <laughs> <laughs> These are straight people. <laughs> conservatives really love the smell of other conservatives. Liberals don't like the smell so much of conservatives. We also did this on voice tone, and we got an interesting effect where it was actually the opposite, um, where um, uh, conservatives, didn't like, this, uh, conservatives uh, didn't like the sound of liberal voices. So why does this matter? It matters for violence. It matters for um, things that we care about in the world. We see these kinds of things all the time, every day, and particularly in the news at the moment, um, uh, issues around fear. And we did a study uh, looking both genetically and um, with clinical and self-report on fear. And interestingly, we found that it's not the case that um, conservatives are more fearful. It's the case that fearful people are more conservative. So the one thing I'd like to say is I've been talking, and we've all been talking about different perspectives. But these differences sit on foundations of universality. We all want to be happy. We all want to be prosperous. We want to be healthy. We want our children to have a good life. And that universality, we're more similar than we are different. And so I really hope that all of you uh, join, if you have not already on Tuesday, in our great democratic experiment and vote. And if you want to know more about this, um, you're welcome to take a look at the book that we did on evolution, biology, and politics with my primary collaborator, Peter Tommy. Thank you very much.